Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's Meeting of the Minds webinar on behavior changes, technology, and public-private partnerships to improve urban congestion. During each webinar, we take a quick reading on who's joined us, so you'll see a poll pop up asking which sector best defines you. Let us know your response, and that will help Jose know who's in the room with us. My name is Jesse Feller-Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Meeting of the Minds. Meeting of the Minds, as many of you know, is a global thought leadership network and platform for knowledge sharing with year-round digital and in-person programming. We connect global urban sustainability, innovation, and technology leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions through our blog, monthly webinar series, and more than 20 events each year. Our next webinar is on March 27th, next month, and we'll cover the topic of smart communities, how 5G mobility, vision zero, and multimodal approaches are converging. You can find all of our upcoming events, including our webinars, in the events section of our website at meaningoftheminds.org. A few housekeeping notes to begin. Because of our very large audience in attendance today, you will remain muted throughout the event. Today's slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available on our website after the event for you to share with colleagues that couldn't make it today. You can also find today's presentation as a PDF in the handout section in the control panel, which you can already download now. It's at the bottom of your control panel. You, we will have a Q&A during the second half of the hour. When you have a question, please type them into the questions panel in your attendee control panel as you think of them. So let's see those poll results. 36% private sector, 33% public sector, 9% nonprofit, 1% philanthropy, and 21% academics. Great. Thank you so much, you guys. That helps us know a little bit more about the breakdown. Um, we would appreciate your input regarding today's webinar. So a short survey will pop up when you close your browser at the end of the event. I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Jose Holguin Vera is the William H. Hart Professor and Director of the VREF Center of Excellence for Sustainable Urban Freight Systems at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He's the recipient of numerous awards including the 2013 White House's Transportation Champion of Change Award and the 1996 Milton Pekarski Memorial Award. His research interests are in freight transportation and disaster response logistics. His work on disaster response has played an influential role in disaster response procedures and has led to deeper insight into how to best respond to large disasters and catastrophic events. So with that, Jose, take it away. Fantastic. Well, it really gives me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about our experiences with public-private and academic partnerships. Basically, I want to mention at the very beginning that the what I'm going to present today is basically not only my work. It's basically is the work of literally hundreds of individuals both public sector, private sector researchers that have basically contributed to these um, to these efforts. I, mean, I, would, I would like to start with giving an idea about what we're going to discuss. At first, I'm going to give you my take about a basic principle in dealing with complex problems. Then we're going to talk about the magnitude of the challenge and the limits of technology in the um, in in dealing with issues pertaining to congestion and then i'm going to go to i'm going to talk a bit about the role of the multiple stakeholders and then we're going to focus on of our delivery programs that we have helped implement in in three major cities uh, in the world and at the end basically i'm going to share with you some concluding comments in dealing with congestion, I find the, what I call the Jose's principle quite useful. In essence, a perfect solutions to complex problems are always wrong. And the reason is that whenever we have a perfect solution, we need to ask ourselves why somebody else did not find that before. Now, this has two implications. The first one is that congestion issues are not new, are very old. And that, again, there are no magic bullets that we could use. Just to give you a sense, from a historical perspective, this is uh, an excerpt 
from the Lex Julius Municipalis that was uh, is an edict issued by Julius Caesar, in which, of all things, he is basically mandating of our deliveries to be conducted in ancient Rome. By the way, this thing at the end didn't work well because of the noise, and we're going to get back to the noise issue later in the talk. What you see here is a picture of New York City at the beginning of the 20th century, and what is more striking about it is the amount of freight than this. And this is a reflection of the that cities are markets, markets where people go to find businesses, service, and supplies that they cannot find elsewhere. In this slide, what you have is a, is a, a scanned version of a popular science monthly from 1925, in which they're talking about cities, about the cities of the future. And as you can see here somewhere, they have here a picture of a blimp that was, in essence, the drones of of the 1920s. Of the 1920s. Give an idea about the how uh, fascinating technology it has been to us for a, for a while. This is basically a picture of Midtown Manhattan in the 1940s. What do we see here? Masses of trucks making deliveries because, as I said. A series of markets, and this this amount of traffic here reflects that. Now, what I want to do now is to move to the um, to show you some of the results of the analysis that we have been doing pertaining to the magnitude of freight activity in cities. What we have here in this slide, you have estimate of the amount of freight trip generation on a per capita basis uh, in three different periods of time. Uh, starting here in 1963, this is basically a, it's a post-process that we did of a major survey conducted in, in the New York City metropolitan area in 1963. If you take the all the freight traffic estimated by the survey, and you divide this by the total population in the area, we get like an indicator of freight traffic expressed as a function of, of people. Okay. In essence, what that means is that in the 1960s, at the height of the, of the manufacturing industry in the United States, that the amount of freight produced, freight trips, was about 015 in essence, for every six citizen, about one truck trip was generated every single day. Now, if we move forward to 2009, we can see our estimate is that the rate of, of per capita generation of freight trips declined to about 0 0.08. Again, if we move again forward to 2017, the rate is about the same. What is new here, is this yellow box here on top that reflect the number of internet deliveries to households. In 2009, according to the National Transportation uh, Household Transportation Survey, the rate of generation of internet deliveries to households across the U.S. was about 0 0.04. In essence, for every 25 people, one internet delivery was made in 2009. Now, in 2017, that triple, reflecting the increased use of e-commerce. Now, what is interesting here is that this rate of 0.12, that is kind of about the same rate that we had in 1960s, it, it's not the highest. The data that we, that we have from uh, South Korea indicate that in 2017, the rate was 0.20. In essence, what this what this um, what this what this indicate is that the due to the increase of internet, uh, the increase in the use of internet commerce, and new modality, modalities like the on-demand internet economy, all indications tell that freight traffic will continue to increase quite dramatically. That's something that we need to keep in mind. As you can see here. The amount of traffic is still to commercial establishment is basically relatively the same. The problem will get worse. 
another important aspect I want to, I think is important to discuss, is what, we call, what is called the efficiency paradox. As you know, uh, freight traffic is a major consumer of energy. And basically, light trucks and medium heavy trucks use, as shown in this slide, a significant amount of energy. Now, interestingly enough, between 1970 and 2014, the efficiency of express and vehicle mile decrease uh, by at a rate of about 1.4% for light trucks and 0.3% for, for heavy trucks, due to, in essence, increases in the efficiency of energy. But interestingly enough, at the same time, it, the total uh, energy use increase by a factor of 4 and 3.1%. And basically, the question is, what is how could we have more efficient uh, freight transportation system, and at the same time, how could they increase total consumption? Well, the answer was provided more than 100 years ago by this fellow that we have here. This is a, it's a British economist, basically, uh, his name was uh, William Stanley Gibbons, that he analyzed at the very height of the Industrial Revolution he analyzed the consumption of coal. And what he found is that whenever we have technologies that lead to lower prices of a given resource, they in induce demand in the long term. The reason why total, if the energy consumed by the freight sector has increased is due to things like what? A globalization, internet deliveries, and the like. In essence, we are using freight more intensively than before. The implication is that um, a technology by itself a, might not, are not likely to produce a complete solution to the problems. They certainly are part of the solution, but uh, in all in specific instances, there will be a technological solution that will address all needs. That brings me to, to the next question. I mean, what is what we should do to address these issues. The history shows that the public sector, the private sector, communities, and ad academia, all of them have tried to address the issues related to congestion and environmental issues since ancient times. But the reality is that uh, our analysis indicate that the quest for, for congestion relief and sustainability belong to a class of problems that co referred to as coordination problems. In essence, these are problems in which unilateral actions eh, without being accompanied for complementary efforts eh, are doomed to fail. This is the case, the traditional case in congestion. What are the challenges to overcome this, to basically get a, a multiple stakeholders to address freight-related issues? Well, there are many. Lack of trust, lack of a tradition of cooperation, lack of knowledge on how to change the behavior of supply chain, lack, lack of technical procedures. Because again, uh, we're still, uh, from, the, from the public policy point of view, we're still grappling with how to induce supply chain to change for the, for the better. In essence, this situation is analogous to having to live a humongous weight, as illustrated here in the in this slide. In essence, we need public sector, we need private sector, research universities, and also communities. All these stakeholders have an important role to to play. What could we do? How could we uh, improve things? Well, the reality is that there is a wide range of uh, initiatives that are basically summarized in this slide that could be undertaken. Uh, for the purposes of this webinar, I'm going to focus on one particular instance of demand management that is the of our delivery projects. What this uh, program seek, uh, seek to do is to induce a change of the in the timing of, of deliveries from the day hours to, to the night hours. Basically, uh, what do we gain by doing that? Well, we have that enable a, a reduction of the externalities produced by freight traffic during the day hours, 
create use conflicts with pedestrians, bicycles, buses, etc., etc., and also increases the economic productivity of, of supply chain. In essence, it's a like win-win. Now, uh, the only issue is noise, but if, if we do of our deliveries using low noise delivery technologies and practices, basically it's a situation that benefits all. And this is basically the kind of efforts I'm going to describe. Now, the prevailing wisdom before uh, undertaking this research was that off our deliveries was basically a really bad idea. I mean, at the beginning, the public sector view was, this is something for the private sector. The private sector view was, well, this is a good idea, but it's a good idea that needs support from the public sector. And since this support will not happen, we shouldn't waste our time. And basically, we have this is a, a summary of some of the, of the statements that people made at the beginning of our research. Some of them are interesting, like um, that all, the of our deliveries are not workable that the food and restaurant sector is the worst, that units will be against, that driver will be against of our delivery because of safety, etc., etc. Later on, I will tell you what really happened. I'm going to discuss in this webinar three different uh, of our delivery programs that we have uh, basically uh, collaborated with in New York City, Bogota, Colombia, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. Just to give you a sense about the uh, the type of issues generated by freight traffic, I'm going to present two slides. These two slides represent the amount of CO2 emissions produced by delivery trucks. This is basically a truck that, by the way, doesn't start here. It is it is started in Pennsylvania, about 50 miles to the to the left of this line, and and this circle that you see here represents the cumulative amount of CO2 that has been released by the truck. We we estimated this using um, GPS tracks, second by second, and we uh, we have, we apply some uh, so, some models that we developed that use the GPS tracks on a second by second basis to compute the amount of pollution it produces. And as you can see here, as soon as the vehicles enter to try to enter to, to Manhattan, then the amount of pollution explodes, particularly here, trying to enter to the delivery area. Here you have another case, another truck that basically you can see here. In this particular case, it take, this this um, truck is taking the George Washington Bridge. It comes here to the Homes Point, and from here it, may, it starts to make deliveries in the area. And as you can see here, that gives you a sense about where the pollution is being produced and who is in, impacted by it. Let me talk a bit about the, the case of New York City. Uh, findings. Uh, we started working on this uh, concept in about 15 years ago, in 2003. What, we, what the research found was that the receivers are the key decision maker. They are the ones that decide on delivery times. And all our deliveries are feasible if receivers agree to them. Interestingly enough, in contrast to the prevailing prevailing wisdom at the time, we found the surveys that we conducted indicated that the food and re restaurant retail, they are the most inclined to participate. Interestingly enough, when we talked to the unions about it, the unions basically were not necessarily against us. As long as people uh, engaged them, uh, basically they were okay. Interestingly enough, drivers feel safer doing of our deliveries. Because when you compute, when they do their own computational safety, they have to account for the risk associated with driving in highly congested areas. That, a, that is basically the overall risk is slower during the night hours. A other important findings is that essentially we need to provide incentive to receivers. A, interestingly enough, about one third of the receivers have trusted vendors. They are vendors that they would allow to make deliveries without supervision at night. In essence, about 30% of receivers could do of our deliveries without major trouble. And at the end, as I mentioned before, that somehow we need to use, commit to low noise delivery practice, practices and technologies to mitigate the negative impacts on local communities. Essentially, 
how could we make all of this happen? In essence, we need to have a public sector basically willing to innovate, convene and coordinate the efforts, engage the private sector, facilitate pilot testing of these new ideas, and also, and above all, set the foundation for long-term cooperation. We also need research universities because the, it happens that since there are no established procedures on how to do, how to deal with these issues, they are the ones that have to be uh, basically finding out uh, novel solutions. The universities also play a very important role as custodians of private sector data. Uh, essentially, uh, the private sector typically feel more uh, comfortable sharing data with researchers than sharing data with uh, the, the public sector for confidentiality reasons. And in essence, having universities in the middle playing the role of an honest broker and arbiter of the disputes that always, always, always uh, come up between public and private sector, universities uh, we have found have played a good role in that. We also need the private sector, I mean, willing to to participate in the process uh, that provides honest input to the policy making process, willing to provide their views and your assistance in trying the, to develop um, a, innovative ways to, to do deliveries. And we also need communities, the communities uh, that can understand the, the need for behavior changes, because as I, as I indicated in my initial comments, uh, somehow, if we keep purchasing stuff through the internet in the amounts that uh, uh, that we that we might, uh, we are going to uh, produce tremendous damage to the to the to the environment. So how we need to take that into account. After putting together these factors, basically in New York City, we were able to complete a, a pilot. In fact, two rounds of that that were basically very successful and were widely reported in the in the media. Now, the success of this, of this, um, a, of the New York City effort basically had consequences I'm going to mention later on. This is basically a plot of the a average mean speed. And as you can see here, if you compare the day hours versus the night hours, the speeds are more than twice and fast. But interestingly enough, one of the most significant impact was the impact on the service times in the amount of, of, of time that the trucks spend at the given location. In the day hours, they have to park, park farther away. They, they spend a very high number of uh, a, a long periods of time just simply parking and walking to the delivery stores. And that was uh, in the night hours, as indicated here, a service time are way shorter. Right now, in New York City, the, uh, there are basically more than 400 companies doing um, if, of our deliveries. This is some of the, of, the, of the biggest ones here. Essentially, uh, these numbers represent about 4% of all the establishments in the accommodation and food sector in Manhattan. Now, the plan for New York City uh, is basically to make another push to try to reach 900 establishments within a year or two. Uh, what this slide has, this slide shows, just to give you an idea about the difference between day deliveries and night deliveries, in red you have uh, deliveries in the regular hours, and in green you have deliveries uh, during the off hours. Essentially here, you see, this is basically it's the trajectory of the trucks that I showed you before, coming from Pennsylvania. And as soon as they hit the uh, Hudson River crossing, I mean, the pollution spikes. Because this is basically idling, trying to move ahead in congestion. As you can see here, the average distance that they are able to travel is about 125 kilometers. Now, in the off hours, they are able to cross faster that means that they could basically make more deliveries and more efficiently. And they travel a, a bit longer, but still they end up producing less pollution than before. That gives you a sense about the, uh, the nature of the, of the impacts. The success of, the, of our delivery project in New York City 
led to a great deal of interest, I mean, both in the U.S. and abroad. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on these two programs in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Bogota, Colombia. In essence, in, in order to foster uh, of our deliveries abroad, uh, our Center of Excellence and, and the partners organized a number of workshops. We concluded early on that organizing this workshop was essential because somehow we need to bring we need to bring the public and private sector together to somehow uh, basically to show to both of them what could be accomplished by means of public-private academic collaboration. Uh, in many cases, uh, these workshops were the first time in, in which both sectors kind of got together to discuss things. You see, that was basically the, the main intent. And it was very effective in doing that. These are some of the pictures of some of these workshops. At the top, we have the um, the workshop, that, the first workshop that we, that we did in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in the in the bottom you have the one in in Colombia. Interestingly enough, the uh, workshop in Sao Paulo was attended by maybe about 20 people, but that was tremendously effective because the right people were there, as you're going to see in a minute. In the case of Sao Paulo. Following this small workshop, both the public sector, the local, the University of Sao Paulo, and the, um, and the public sector got together and put together a pilot. And what I'm going to present here is basically the, the results. That was a, an all volunteer companies, 11 companies with 45 receivers. And basically, uh, a, this is some of the results. Speeds you have here, speeds are basically uh, about three times faster, kind of the same order of magnitude as in New York. Uh, again, basically, that was to be expected. What, what you have here, this in this slide, you have a delivery time in the vertical axis, and then you have the number of parcels delivered in the, uh, in the horizontal axis. And these green dots represent the, the, the condition during the day hours. Now, these blue dots, these blue squares, represent what happened when they switch the same routes to the to the off hours. As you can see here, if we kind of focus here on the centroids of these observations, you could see that the carriers were able to deliver more supplies faster because of the or doing the deliveries in the in the night hours. In the case of Colombia, in collaboration with our partners with the National University of Colombia in Bogota, we focus on this industrial area in Bogota that is a very congested city. Essentially, we have about two dozen companies that participated in the first pilot. Again, similar results. This is basically the speeds during the, the night hours and then the speeds during the day hours. You can see I mean, significant uh, improvements, as already found in the case of New York City and Sao Paulo. Here, my colleagues uh, produce estimates of the cost savings, uh, obviously reflected here. The average savings is basically about 32%, which is significant. Over the results, if we put together all these, these three trials, in the, I forgot to mention, in the case of Bogota, they didn't do like a, a full of our delivery implementation. By full, I mean deep into the night. In the case of Bogota, what they did was to delay deliveries to the period between 6 to 10 p.m. And even that shift of hours reduced pollution uh, the emission produced by the vehicles by 13%, which is, I mean, quite significant, and, and reduced costs by 32%. That gives an indication of that. In the case of the New York City Sao Paulo, the re emission reductions were in the range of 50% 50, 50 for Sao Paulo and 67% for New York City. 
for New York City. In addition to that, there were the substantial cost reductions in the range of 30 to 55 percent, depending on the on the delivery routes. This is important because the um, the last mile, the cost of the last mile portion of the of the trips represents between 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of transport. That means increases in the effective in the in the efficiency of the last mile deliveries reduce a major component of cost, increasing the competitiveness of local economies. And that's very important. If we basically use this uh, estimate and we extrapolate what will happen uh, worldwide if we implement off our deliveries under different scenarios, I mean, the numbers are basically jaw dropping. Implementing of our deliveries in the top 10 cities will basically lead to a reductions in CO2 in the range of uh, 70 or 70 uh, million tons per year. Depend if we basically move to depending on how many cities we are uh, in, uh, depending on how many cities we implement of our deliveries, the range of value ranges from 70 to close to 300 million tons of CO2 per year. These are basically tremendous numbers. Now, interestingly here is to notice that the, the biggest beneficiaries of this will be cities in developing countries that are the, typically the biggest cities in the planet. And basically, in essence, implementing of our deliveries not only will reduce the pollution producing this cities, but also it will increase the, the economic competitiveness of the local economies. Lessons learned. Basically, about the process, it, what we found out is that uh, this uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration is critical. In essence, without the participation of all these major sectors, I mean, the whole thing falls apart. Uh, we also found that, and that was also conveyed to us by both our public sector and private sector partners, that the role of the academic institutions is essential because it's, um, it provides a safe space for innovation. It provides a, somebody in between that could play the role of an honest broker and somehow arbitrate the disputes. And, uh, and we found that to be essential. In all the successful uh, implementation of, of our deliveries, in all cases, there is an academic institution in the mix. Something important is that uh, uh, we need to be patient in this. In essence, we simply cannot rush things. Uh, we need to move at the speed of the slowest partner. And basically, it's something that uh, is the nature of the animal. We cannot, in many cases, the private sector is, uh, is consumed with running their businesses. And they simply uh, cannot uh, dedicate uh, a great deal of time to participate in, in pilot tests and things like that. So how we need, we need to account for that, and we need to basically be ready to be patient. There will be all setbacks, and somehow we need to be ready and keep moving. All the important lessons about the impact is that uh, there, was a, there is a striking similarity among all these pilots. I mean, the attitude of public and private sector before the pilot was very similar. I mean, a great deal of skepticism. And at the end, after the pilot, I mean, enthusiastic support. <laughs> basically, that's basically, it was the same across in all cases. There is inertia. And the, there is inertia because, again, we are trying to, uh, in essence, what we are trying to do is to induce a switch in the way that people do things. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, another important lesson is that um, uh, of our deliveries is not something exclusive to big and sophisticated cities like New York. I mean, it basically, it's something that could be implemented. I mean, pretty much in any city in which congestion is a major issue. Uh, in all cases, another important lesson is that the uh, uh, the pilots have basically created momentum. In the case of New York City, the uh, 
the off hour delivery program has been growing on its own and now I have led the private sec the public sector to to push for another push for uh, for the uh, extension of the program in the case of Colombia the uh, the success of the of the Bogota uh, trial led the Colombian government to uh, initiate a pilot test in four additional cities in the case of Sao Paulo uh, after the pilot ended I mean, many companies have moved to the off hours. And, you know, it's basically something that is very interesting. Again, a, something important here is that uh, implementing of our deliveries is getting, I mean, uh, uh, easier and easier. Uh, the first pilot that we did in New York was very, very difficult. The second round that we did, we, we more than the number of participants, I mean, increased by a factor of 10. In the, in the same time, it took us to have 35 participants. In essence, the, this is the power of example. But in all cases, we need to be uh, a consistent and, and, and we need to be persistent and basically keep uh, uh, moving ahead. A, a difference between these two pilots, between Sao Paulo, Bogota, and New York, is that um, they did not provide any incentives. In the case of New York, a, a financial incentive was provided to the uh, to the participants for them to 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 undertake to participate in the program. Uh, in essence, both São Paulo and Bogotá demonstrated that it is possible to do it without incentive, but somehow there is a limit to that. Uh, with that, these are some of the references that uh, that I use in my in my talk. This is about freight trip generation. And this is about those interested in the general topic of urban freight policy and management might be advised to take a look at this, these documents. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jose. Wonderful. Um, we are going to move now into our Q&A. We already have a lot of questions coming in. Um, just to build on your last slide, uh, Jose, Rich Dooley, is asking um, what were the incentives provided in New York City? Were there financial incentives or policy incentives? What parking incentives? Can you can you elaborate a little bit? Basically, uh, there, there are different companies might be interested in different type of incentives. As part of the of the research project that we uh, undertook, we provided uh, a financial incentive. Now. In addition to that, we have we took um, a, we conducted behavior research to find out what type of incentive could be provided, and there are many companies that, for instance, value public recognition. You see, public recognition. There's a, a there are companies that are, are interested in in being good citizens, in which basically uh, companies like that uh, it could be. Uh, very sensitive to be recognized by the city. And there is a, a wide range of incentives that could be provided. In some cases, it might be accommodations with uh, a, basically a, m m maybe more relaxed a, traffic rules in some areas. There might be a, a multiple combination of incentives that could be used. A financial, non-financial, you know, some relaxation of traffic rules, et cetera, et cetera to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And is there, Jose, is there a study from your last slide that you would, ref you would refer to, your second to last slide, for more on those incentives and the details of that were used? Uh, yes. And we have, okay. uh, we have uh, reports and publications in which basically we uh, explain the details of the incentives of the uh, and also the uh, the results of the research that we did in terms of how effective the various incentives could be and uh, I will be more more than glad to share this uh, report with you guys okay great so if you're interested you can email Jose at the email he provides on the slide great um, yeah so just a reminder if you have questions you can type them into your questions control panel at the right of your screen we have a lot of questions that have already come in, but if you have any, feel free to type them in there. Um, 
Vanessa Fox is asking, Jose, did you do any calculations as the fleets became electric or natural gas powered or cleaner fuel, using cleaner fuel? Um, is that something that you will do in the future or was that included in any of the calculations you did? That's a very interesting topic. <laughs> very interesting. We, in essence, the emission reduction that we that we calculated are basically used the standard diesel trucks. Now, what we did find out is that uh, of our deliveries uh, increases the competitiveness of electric trucks. Uh, as you know, electric trucks have a very um, low uh, operating cost, but they have a higher fixed cost because they, they cost more. Uh, but it happens that if you could use electric trucks in double duty, day and night, uh, that increases how competitive they are. Uh, as long as you could basically uh, charge them in between both operations, uh, combining of our deliveries with the use of electric vehicles uh, could be uh, a very potent combination. Because in essence, the, uh, the, uh, the deterioration, the depreciation of the vehicles is lower they have lower operating costs, and if you use them in double duty, they become more competitive. Great. And Claudia Sarmiento um, has a little bit more detailed question around that. She, she said, thanks for such an interesting talk. Could better last mile logistics further improve traffic congestion or the opposite? Specifically, Claudio is researching switching to smaller electric or non-motorized vehicles for the last mile traveled by freight in urban centers. Do you have any thoughts about last mile freight in smaller electric non-motorized vehicles, Jose? Yes, we have a, a very active research program in which we um, a, we we have done a great deal of analysis on the on the uh, on what is the um, the optimal vehicle size, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there is some uh, there is a mix. I believe that a logistics, a improvement in logistics, like uh, using combination of, of trucks with, let's say, uh, electric bikes and even handcarts could basically reduce the uh, the emissions produced at the local level, you know, because instead of the truck traveling from, from block to block to make deliveries, if you have a basically non-polluting means Taking care of the last leg of the of distribution that could help, but there is also this is basically for the for the uh, the the mini let's say for the last leg of the deliveries the last 50 feet. You know. However, at the level of uh, traveling from at the level of travel between warehouses to to the uh, to delivery areas. Uh, typically, the best policy is to use the largest vehicle that could be used safely in the network. Because in essence, the carriers, the freight carriers, are quite rational. If they use a big truck, it's because they need it. They will not use a big truck only to, to transport a small amount of cargo. And the issue is that if we force uh, carriers to downsize the vehicle size, the amount of vehicle mass travel is going to increase because instead of sending one one truck with a capacity of let's say between six to twenty tons, they if they have to send multiple small trucks, the amount of congestion congestion and pollution will increase. Great. Okay. And if you have more on that, you um Jose is more than happy to receive your emails with his email up on the slide right now. Um, good question. So Jim Ogara, hi Jim, um, has a question. Um, did you take, did the, your study, Jose, take into account the impact, cost pollution impacts of keeping the receiving and delivering open during the off hour delivery hours? Are there other costs associated as the transport system moves towards 100% utilization? Basically, a we didn't account for things like um, a electricity and things like this, 
Now, uh, we didn't account for that at the we didn't account for that at the receiving locations, because in the case of the receivers, the receivers in your city are doing unassisted of our deliveries. In essence, we incentivize them to give access to their vendors. That means if vendors come, open the establishment, deposit the goods, and leave. There is no staff present there. Now, in the cases of Sao Paulo and, and Bogota, Colombia, they had staff receiving the goods. But we didn't, we didn't account for the uh, additional cost for that because we've, com uh, comparatively speaking, in the case of New York City, they were to be relatively minor. Great. And you had mentioned that there was an expectation that restaurants would be against this, but they were actually very much pro off hour delivery. Um, Giuseppe Lupino is asking, um, he said, great presentation, by the way. Considering the working time of restaurants, um, can you talk a little bit about whether did they were did you guys get any complaints from their side? I and mean, they are open at 7 p.m., right? Was there more complaints if there was deliveries after midnight when they were closed? Or can you talk a little bit more yeah. about the the response of restaurants? Oh, yeah. Originally, as I mentioned before, I mean, the prevailing assumption was that uh, a restaurants will be the worst sector, the worst. In fact, reports were written by a very prominent consulting companies indicating that uh, of our deliveries in Manhattan, of our deliveries to restaurants didn't make any sense. Again, basically, as researchers, we decided to ask them, you see, instead of trying to uh, to guess what the response would be, we conducted surveys. Lo and behold, when we conducted the surveys, we found out that restaurants were the most enthusiastic about the idea. I mean, that was quite a shock. And the reality basically confirmed that after the pilot test. Let me give you a some, uh, let me explain, in, I, I'm going to try to explain this, uh, paraphrasing the, the the comments that we received from restaurant owners. I remember the case of uh, a fellow called Nick Kenner, that was the owner of a restaurant called Just Salad in Manhattan. We, after the success of the first pilot, we called him and we wanted to hear from them exactly why, why do you like it? And uh, Nick Kenner told me, look, Jose, in the in the day hours, with day deliveries, we never know when the supplies are going to show up. They could be 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, and if there is an accident in I-95, I mean, the truck might not show up. And that is basically day deliveries. With night deliveries, when we open the store at 5 o'clock in the morning, all the produce, all the supplies are sitting right there. If there is an error, he called the, the vendor, and within an hour, he get the replacement. Now, if he find an error at 11 o'clock in the morning, he will be lucky if he could get replacements by 5 p.m. You see, in essence, what people were saying that of our deliveries, we reduce the quality of the food because the food will take longer to get to the restaurants. And it's exactly the opposite. The, they get fresher products earlier in the day. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, in essence, this restaurant, before with day deliveries, they needed to have a day and a half of, of supplies to protect themselves against shortages. With day deliveries, they reduce that to simply one day. And this right. basically, uh, and, and that's basically the the uh, the main benefit to them. Yeah, great example, very very specific like that. Um, fantastic. So, um, moving over to a kind of separate question, um, have you looked at uh, day use lockers, which is a pilot being done in in um, Seattle, and if that's is that part of your research at all? Yes, we have looked at lockers. Again, we um, lockers could play an important role in some deliveries. And in fact, when we began the off-hour delivery project, we also considered the use of uh, 
of delivery lockers, eh, double doors, eh, let's say electronic, electronic cages, that means an area in a building, cordoned by, let's say, laser beams and the like. Eh, all these techniques could, could play a, a complementary role eh, in this thing. But at the end, basically, we move because of the, um, eh, because we found out that about 30% more than about 32% of the of receivers have trusted vendors. It's about, think about the following, one out of three receivers have trusted vendors. They are basically vendors that they will allow, that they will allow access to make deliveries without supervision. In essence, we change focus to simply inducing receivers to give access to these trusted vendors because it's more effective than the uh, using uh, lockers or any other technologies. Now, I do not mean to, I, I do not want to be uh, uh, perceived as saying that I am against lockers. Uh, what I am saying is that for off hour deliveries, uh, we decided to push for unassisted off hour deliveries without having to deal with lockers. But lockers could play a role for other types of deliveries. Great. Good, good, good. Um, someone has a question about the recording be archived afterwards. Yes, yes, yes. We always record all of our monthly webinars, and they are all available um, at the top of our website at meetingoftheminds.org on the top menu. On the right is the uh, archive section, and you can see all the past webinars right there. And today's webinar will be available by tomorrow in, the sec in that section of our website. Um, question about... Um, your research, Grant Duckworth is asking, did your research on our delivery identify any positive externalities on Vision Zero Public Safety Reduced Traffic Fatalities Program? Yes. We have done, the uh, my colleagues at NYU have done some analysis on that, and they basically indicate that by, in essence, kind of segregating traffic, I mean, uh, separating truck uh, and passenger cars, there are improvements in, in safety. Great. And what department is that at New York City? If someone's interested in looking at that research, maybe they have some white papers on the website, or what part of we, we, NYU we, is that? We, yes, we, we wrote papers, and uh, if you send me uh, an email, I'll, I'll, I'll track them and send it to the interested parties, to the interested Great. person. Thank you so much, Jose. Yeah. Um, so a question about policy frameworks. Do you think this research could imp impact um, any policy changes to New York City or any of the others um, to mandate or incentivize these practices going forward? And also a question, same kind of question, but do you, are there any plans to approach the federal government or EPA or other to consider a policy framework to catalyze city adoption? And what do you think is in the future Jose, around city policy and federal policy around this? Basically, I think the uh, I, off hour delivery works as long as it is a voluntary program. I mandate concern me a great deal because if, if we make this, um, let's say, as part of a voluntary program, basically in which we engage receivers and carriers and try to induce them to, uh, to do off hour deliveries. Uh, if we do it that way, there was there is always a net economic gain because we are not forcing anyone that cannot do it to do it. Now, if we force people to do of our deliveries, uh, we might encounter cases in which uh, businesses are going to be negatively affected, and simply we do not want that. That means I I am basically in favor of voluntary programs. I do believe that regulation has a role to play in some issues, in some circumstances, but maybe not in this one. I believe that the, the best thing that the uh, public sector could do is to try to develop like a long-term uh, collaboration with private sector academics. Uh, basically, to, to engage them on how to address issues on a gradual basis. See, the issues sometimes politically imperative clash against long-term collaboration. 
I think that the um, in the case of New York City, that had had an impact. Both the the Bloomberg and the the Blasio administration have embraced of our deliveries as part of their sustainability plans, and and that is speak um, a very well of them in terms of the the vision they have of trying to implement innovative concepts. I mean, this project already had an impact on the on New York City. Uh, New York City now is interested in increase in in basically increasing the size of the program. And in same in, in Brazil, same in Colombia. Uh, I think that the um, what I think that it should be done in order to scale up this is to educate people. Uh, we found we basically when we uh, did the, the of our delivery project, we also about why diff, why not more cities uh, embrace the the program try to do something about. It. And what we found out that nobody seemed to know how to do it. And basically, that's why we that's why we implement these workshops, in which we gather city by city, public sector and private sector, and and give us some basic instruction on how to move forward, and that is needed. I would say if I were to emphasize something, I would I would emphasize the element of education and outreach. And that's what Great. I would do first. Great. So is that the main strategy that you foresee to get to those 900 businesses that you mentioned in the New York, in New York City um, to do that outreach and recruitment? What are what are some like the three key tactics to grow to 900 businesses? Is it workshop? Is from the from the De Blasio's office, or is it um, going door to door? What what are some tactics you guys think would work to reach those 900 businesses? I cannot speak on behalf of New York City DOT. <laughs> basically, that's something that uh, basically, <laughs> I, I cannot just speak about this. <laughs> basically, I will let them. Uh, but basically, they. Uh, my sense is what I would advise is to. It's a combination of things: a uh, outreach, uh, marketing, uh, uh, basically uh, recognizing good companies. Companies are doing good things for the city. One of the things that we are doing that is that we um, we develop a, a, we we funding from the New York State Research Energy Research and Development Agency, NYSERDA. We develop a trusted vendor program. The idea here is trusted vendor. There are there are many companies doing of our deliveries for a long time, and doing that without any problems. And, and the the fundamental tenet of this program is to, I mean, basically uh, publicize these great companies, because one of the issues is that the the receivers might be concerned about allowing someone else to to make deliveries without supervision. And what we plan to do with this trusted vendor program is to uh, is to publicize the companies. And uh, right. if, if there are companies interested in that and participating in the trusted vendor program, let me know. In essence, there might be a lot of soft ways. Incentive uh, could be could help. Incentive, public recognition, education, outreach, you know. Uh, all the things could be effective. Great. Wonderful. So there's some questions we haven't been able to get to. Sorry, everyone. Um, and and Marcus, <laughs> two questions there. Sorry, Anne, we're running out of time. But um, feel free to email Jose directly. His email is on the slide, and um, or email me if you want to get in touch with Jose. But um, better just to email him since he's providing his information. And thank you so much, Jose, for your time today. That was fantastic research. Congratulations on all the work you're doing and the the adoption of off-hour delivery pilots all around the world. So. Um, couple key items to close. A short survey will pop up once you all close your browser, and we really appreciate your feedback. Um, we hope to see you at one of our upcoming events, which are all available in the events section of our website at meaningoftheminds.org. We have a webinar next month on March 27th um, that was going to talk about smart communities, how 5G mobility 
Vision Zero multimodal approaches are converging. So a little bit of overlap with today, but a little different. And love to see you there. And big thanks to Jose for presenting today and taking the time out to share your work with us. Thank you so much, Jose. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our session for today. So have a great day. And thanks again for attending. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot.